Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Welcome to the Ask It podcast. The Ask It podcast encourages talking about talking, facilitates your own inner wisdom, and rather than providing answers, considers good questions. Good morning, wise ones. Today I'm talking to H.G. Tudor. I'm asking him to tell us everything he knows about narcissism. Hello, Lucinda. Hello there. Thank you so much for giving your time to speak to me today. You're welcome. For obvious reasons, you never reveal your face. So nobody knows what you look like. um, Mm -hmm. And and that's fair enough. So... um, I suppose, can I open by asking you what I ask all my guests, which is, how would you introduce you? Okay, my name's H.G. Tudor, which is a pseudonym. I'm a diagnosed narcissistic psychopath. I naturally have a private life, bits of which I share through the work that I do. I have a professional life, little bits of which I share, very little about it. And what most people know me for is that I operate a blog called Knowing the Narcissist and a YouTube channel, which is Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra, which spreads out onto Twitter and onto Facebook, where I explain to people the mindset of me and my kind, how we look at the world, how we deal with people, how we see people, how we understand our victims to be, what we look for, and to enable people to understand why they are drawn to us, why they end up ensnared with us, and probably most importantly, from their perspective, what they can do about it to manage the circumstances, get away from a narcissist, and stay away from that narcissist, and bring understanding into their world so they achieve some form of freedom. So I write extensively about this, and I've created lots and lots of videos and material in something called the Knowledge Vault, and I consult with people to listen to their circumstances and provide them with my expertise and input as to what they need to do. So that's who I am. Thank you. So that intrigues me. So my first question is, why do you do the podcast revealing all this to everybody? What motivates you to do that? As a narcissist, I know that I presume what I've labelled as the prime aims these are four things when anybody comes onto my radar i must control them so that's one of the prime aims i may look to receive fuel from them fuel is essentially an emotional output so if somebody says i love you hg that gives me fuel if they say i hate you hg that gives me fuel they make me a cup of tea that provides me with fuel i look for character traits bits of them that I can bolt on and use for myself and residual benefits and residual benefits in a way is an umbrella term that covers such things as making money, having somewhere to live, somebody to do your laundry and cook your food, um, connections, networks, the creation of a facade. So every single narcissist pursues those four things in some shape or form maybe not all four from every single person, but has to obtain those four things from people within what's known as their fuel matrix. And I'm no different. And one of the things that what I do enables me to achieve is the residual benefit. So the work that I create enables me to control people, not in an unpleasant way, but simply they come to me for answers, which which signifies that they are coming under my control because they want my help. They yeah. don't feel manipulated, so it's a win-win. With the residual benefit, people pay me for my services, so that's a residual benefit. I am an expert, so one is paid for it. But the biggest thing about it, and the major reason why I do it, is that ultimately my physical self will cease to exist, and I will shuffle off this mortal coil, and the Grim Reaper will come for me, and it's game over. That represents, funnily enough, a massive threat to my sense of control. Yes. Therefore, by the yeah, so therefore, by the establishment of my legacy, namely, I know that my work will live on in books, in videos, in material and knowledge vaults, that people will spread news of my work, 
who knows where it will get to in the years ahead. It might be the establishment of Tudor academies to teach people about this work and so on and so forth. So I'll have created this legacy. So when that adamantine side wishes to sever my connection to this plane, I'll know when I go, I win because I'll live on through my work. And therefore that ultimate threat to control is nullified. And that's why I do it. What a brilliant answer. Yes, I absolutely can see that rationale. Okay, so when did you get the idea to first do a podcast? Well, I started off generally writing about my worldview and experiences many, many years ago, but never did anything with it. And then around about 2015, as a consequence of my interaction with the people that I call the good doctors, because I was seeing uh, psychologists, they thought that it would be useful for me to write further about my experiences. Um, they didn't necessarily contemplate me putting it in a blog, although that was uh, something they thought about, that people would benefit from me sharing my work. And I had a little look around on the internet of the existing material and thought, there's a lot of rubbish here. There's a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about. There's a lot of people that actually give out misinformation. They may well be well-intentioned, but what they explain about narcissism is quite simply wrong. And in some instances, they give out dangerous information. And there's information that is incomplete. I looked at that and that's a threat to my control because the inaccuracy of that information about me and my kind annoys me. And therefore, part of the provision of this information, as I said, was for a legacy. But another aspect of it is to nullify those threats to control posed by idiotic material that's put out there. So I started a blog on the 31st of August 2015 called Knowing the Narcissist. And I wrote a number of books utilizing the material that I'd already started to generate. And I wrote quite a lot between 2015 and 2016. I then started to offer consultations to people at the, in October 2016 so that they could come and tap in direct in a bespoke consultation to my expertise. And I built more products and so forth. And around the beginning of 2016, I created a YouTube channel, which I then sort of left uh, in 2019. I would go back and forth to it intermittently. And I resurrected it in October 2020 and then have been prolific with the provision of my video stroke podcasts thereafter. So why do I do the podcast? Well, some people prefer to receive their content by listening to it and visually rather than, rather than reading. And there are different audiences there. And of course, YouTube has a massive reach. So it enables me to get to more people and also as an environment to counter a lot of misinformation that's out there. Yeah, yeah. So you might not want to answer this because I know that you like to be quite private about your personal life. But mm -hmm. as, a, as a therapist, I'm interested in how did you end up in front of doctors? My family insisted that as a consequence of my <laughs> behaviours, inverted commas, something must be done. And there are narcissists in my family, chief of which are my mother and my uncle. And in order to try and shackle and control me, although they are unaware narcissists, they looked at my behavior and basically said something needs to be done about HG. And what they did in order to try and corral me into seeing the good doctors was to threaten to withhold my inheritance, to report me for criminal activity. Now, with the inheritance, I want that, it's my right. And with the criminal allegations, they're just liars. And that's uh, complete nonsense that they fabricated, which is commensurate with the fact that they are narcissists. I recognized that in order to give them the sensation of control over me, that I would go along with it. So it was my decision. I wasn't forced. I, made the, I gave them the impression that they forced me into it. So it allowed them to feel good about themselves. But if I didn't want to do it, I wouldn't have done it. And I would have dealt with getting my inheritance a different way. And the allegations about criminal activity didn't concern me. So what I did was I enabled them to believe that they got one over on me. But I was getting several over on them. I wanted to learn more about myself. And when you put somebody like me into therapy, all you do is make me more dangerous. 
because you allow me to understand more about myself, how I tick, how I function, you're not going to change me. It's just a game to me. And I play games repeatedly and enjoy the game playing with the good doctors as they scramble around. I also wanted to obtain information from one of them um, because of a connection that he had to a member of my family. So it suited me to say, sure, I'll consent to this treatment because it was serving my purposes. And this very neatly encapsulates us into this point. A narcissist will only ever do something for you if it's what we want. You might think that you've persuaded us. You might think that you've threatened us into doing it. You haven't. We do it because we want to. The only way you will ever make a narcissist do something is where you can bring the power of the law against us and we are, a judgment is entered against us or we are physically incarcerated, that type of thing. But if you think that your sweet charm has made us do something for you, uh, I have news for you, you haven't. All that's happened is your interests and ours coincided. So in this instance, their desires to put me into therapy coincided with my desire to know more about myself, to make them think that they were controlling me and for me to lay my hands on certain information. Okay, so you said about your mother and your uncle yes. being unaware. So that brings yes. me to my next question. Do all narcissists know that they're narcissists? No, most don't. Right. The reason for it is that the narcissism is a hermetically sealed defense mechanism. A, a smaller number of narcissists, a smaller percentage, are aware of what they are. They may not use the terms that I use because I've created my own lexicon. Yeah. But for instance, I didn't suddenly wake up one morning and went, oh, I'm a narcissist, aren't I? I wasn't fixed with that knowledge in that way. I knew I was different. I knew I was special. I knew I enjoyed manipulating people. I knew I thrived on the reactions of other individuals. I knew I needed to control them. I hated being ignored. I recognized various traits about me. And as I've explained on many occasions, it was later that a psychology graduate girlfriend of mine pointed out to me that she believed that I was both narcissist and uh, that I was a psychopath. And then she explained all of that. That resonated with me. I didn't say to her, oh, you're absolutely right. Thank you for pointing out. I said, well, that's all very interesting, isn't it? And walked off. But what she said resonated and that gave me labels for what I was. Most narcissists don't know because the narcissism can't let them know because if they did, they'd hesitate and they wouldn't get the prime aims as effectively. So it's a little bit like if I was going to push a stick towards your faceless and you would not do this. Oh, look, HG's pushing a stick towards my eye. That could hurt. I better move my head back and brush the stick to one side because by the time you've thought all of that, I've poked your eye out. So instead, what you do is you instinctively move your head and bat it away. Yeah. So the narcissism mm. can't allow an unaware narcissist with a, with a lower skill set to know what he is. So he, he can't do this. This person's threatening my control. I can see that. I have to have control. How will I get control over this person? What options are available to me? Well, what I could do is just deny the accusation that they're leveling at me and that will frustrate them. So that means that they haven't got that control over me by questioning me and holding me to account. Yes, I'll deny them. That takes too long. They just deny. So their narcissism presents them with, with basically a, a response which they believe is their own response. They pursue fuel, but they don't realize. They have to control, but they don't realize. Yes, you might get some unaware narcissist will talk about, yes, I can be controlling, but that's only because in that instance, the narcissism allows him to say that to control. It's not a genuine admission. Some narcissists will say, there's something wrong with me. I don't know why I keep hurting people. That isn't a genuine admission. The narcissism just says, we will allow you to say that to provoke someone into a reaction so you can control them and draw fuel from them. They don't genuinely, they're just not allowed to know. Most of the time, if you were to say to an unaware narcissist, you're a narcissist, they'll reject it because they can't see it. Even if you were to sit down with them and say, you do this, they'll go, no, I don't. Well, you do this. Well, that's only because you make me. And you do this. Well, that's only because my mother's awkward. There's always an explanation, a denial or a response. You can't get through that barrier to get them to suddenly go, do you know what? I've listened very carefully to what you've explained. And you're absolutely right. I'm a narcissist, aren't I? Hallelujah. That just won't happen. Because 
I was at a conference and I met a fellow therapist colleague and she okay. said she works in London and she said that she mostly has narcissists and they're, they're from the world of celebrity mostly. Okay. But, so I'm, I'm assuming from what you're telling me that the only reason you would end up in therapy um, is because you're an unaware narcissist. And you, and well, you don't you can, know why stuff keeps going wrong. Possibly, yes. So, but there are actually a multiplicity of reasons. If you're aware narcissist, you go down the route that I do, yeah. namely, learn more about yourself, become more effective, and it serves purposes analogous to the ones that I've described. If you're an unaware narcissist, you may not consent ever to going anywhere near a therapist. Those that do invariably then use it as a weapon against other people. So for instance, if their spouse has been saying, you need to go and see somebody, right, I'll go and see somebody. And then they will go. And what can often happen is they might charm the therapist into basically saying there isn't a problem here. So they go back and say, they say there isn't a problem. You must be the problem. Or the, not the, the therapist realizes there's a problem, knows, recognizes that they're a narcissist, but realizes, there's nothing that can be done so it doesn't say to them oh you're a narcissist and of course because of confidentiality doesn't tell the spouse what's going on the narcissist then comes back from the therapy and lies and say oh there's, yeah there's no problem uh she says i don't need to carry on the therapy and says you're you're the problem i've spoken to her and she says and that's just a lie that the narcissist has used he's triangulating the victim with the attendance at therapy so often it might be done in a way of i've addressed my problems you need to go and address yours now. I've been and the therapist says there isn't a problem with me, which sometimes happens or sometimes is a lie. In other instances, they just stay in therapy, making no progress, but they use it to repeatedly triangulate. Well, yeah, I, I recognize sometimes that my behavior can cause uh, problems for people, but I'm in therapy. I'm working on myself. So that creates a facade of them being a decent person, but they actually never change their behaviors. They just continue to hold themselves out as, well, I'm trying to do something about my issues. Uh, are you? Or they just use it as a talking shop where what they'll do is they'll complain about everybody else's conduct towards them, towards the therapist who will sort of sit there and maybe nod and offer observations. And that gives them an unconscious feeling of control over the people that they're complaining about. That's the indirect assertion of control the narcissist achieves. So unaware narcissists will either never go anywhere near a therapist because their narcissism will reject it or the narcissism will basically embrace it because it serves a purpose but it won't allow them to change so people often get confused my colleagues get confused i get confused between narcissism and psychopathy because in both you'll tell me but in both there's a lack of empathy correct yeah. So there's, there's a considerable overlap between the two. And the distinguishing factors that I explain to people are, now remember, I'm a narcissistic psychopath, so I'm a hybrid. So let us take, we have pure narcissist, narcissistic psychopath, psychopath. So main feature of the uh, pure narcissist compared to the other two categories he needs plenty of fuel, needs to control people, experiences fear. Narcissistic psychopath doesn't need as much fuel as a pure narcissist, because it's a halfway house position, doesn't experience fear. Psychopath doesn't need fuel, doesn't experience fear. Those are some key basic differences between the three categories. So a psychopath can often be a loner and only uses people as appliances to alleviate boredom, to cater for impulse. A narcissistic psychopath and a narcissist need people for fuel because it powers us. The validation that comes from being loved or hated gives us that validation. The psychopath doesn't need that. You mentioned <clears throat> this morning in your conversation that there has to be a genetic uh, aspect to narcissism. Mm -hmm. yeah. So are we saying then that if 
if somebody's a narcissist that if you look back in in their family you'll find fellow narcissists yes as Might in your not case be. <clears throat> yes <clears throat> sometimes it's not necessarily your parents it could be further back in the lineage but it's there and you will have heard as i explained to sonia in the conversation earlier today that i gave the example that that's why within a particular house in a monarchy you get narcissist after narcissist after narcissist why well invariably to scramble to the top to be the individual that rules you need to have a certain skill set and having an absence of emotional empathy needing to control people needing to lay your hands on money needing to uh, having a lack of remorse and conscience etc are very good tools for getting to the top and staying there you're not worried about the impact of your actions on people you do what's necessary so that person perhaps through a coup d'etat or some kind of rebellion or civil war uh, what, what an uprising becomes the new leader the new king he's a narcissist he has he has issue that genetic predisposition is likely passed on not guaranteed to be but likely to do so and as i mentioned earlier that child is the heir to the throne is treated in a particular way he's not allowed to be a child he's groomed for office from the day that he's born he's kept apart from his parents a lot of the time has a governess etc nanny he attends the schooling in a particular way he's brought up in statecraft all these various things and basically has people bowing and scraping and uh, kneeling before him and kissing his elbow and kissing his hand and you know who, who could thrive on such rigidity of response and therefore that amounts to a lack of control environment yes it's a very privileged one he's not being beaten up he's not being starved but when does he ever get to make a decision for himself i want to go and play out my friends no you can't you've got to stay in and learn latin i want to be able to go and do that you're not allowed to play with the commoners you're high born you have to stay over here you need to attend this function you now need to go and meet the french princess eight years old and be betrothed to her etc so then that child with a combination of that genetic predisposition and the lack of control environment becomes what a narcissist and then what's the pressure placed upon him you must have an heir to continue the lineage and so it gets passed on so this is not guaranteed but there's a higher proportion of why amongst the offspring it, that generation after generation after generation narcissists appear and you can also see it of course in political dynasties as well that occur in business dynasties that occur these people get to the top they're able to stay at the top and then their offspring that might inherit the business is guess what another narcissist good example of that robert maxwell stole other people's money out of the pension fund he would come downstairs and because of his sense of entitlement on Christmas Day, he would open all of his children's presents before they even got there because he wanted to know what had been bought for them. No emotional empathy for how that impacts upon his children. Look at his offspring. What's Ghislaine Maxwell? A narcissist. So another example there of the apple doesn't fall far, far from the tree. Because oftentimes with these things, they're sliding scales, aren't they? As you've just said, the pure narcissist, the narcissist psychopath, and then the, the psychopath. And so when, when we're studying these things, we can maybe see traits in ourselves. And psychoanalysis absolutely says that, that we, we've all got yeah. our own little inner narcissist. Um, so you would well, go along if with I can just if I, if I can just cut across you there, listen, go for it. I would be, I, I would make a distinction. There's a narcissist and then there's narcissistic traits. Now, yeah. I have narcissistic traits. You have narcissistic traits. I'm a narcissist. I'm assuming you're not. So we'll operate on that basis. You're not. Okay. So you don't have an inner narcissist. What you have is you have narcissistic traits of envy, jealousy, argumentativeness, anger, vanity, pride, etc. I have those as well but mine are most likely far larger than yours you'll have empathic traits alongside those honesty decency compassion caring being an excellent listener i don't have those i feign them but i don't actually have them so when we talk about a sliding scale when you're a narcissist you're a narcissist you're not more of a narcissist than another narcissist you're just a different type but right. we're narcissists so we'll have a, a core of similar behaviors and then variations on the theme so some narcissists use physical violence, others do not. 
Some narcissists have a high cognitive function, others do not. Some operate with a facade, others do not. But we all have no emotional empathy. We're all manipulative. We all need the prime aims. You could have somebody who's narcissistic, meaning that they have strong narcissistic traits and low emotional empathy, but they're not a narcissist. And so if there is a spectrum, it runs from narcissist, narcissistic, normal, empath. And the last three aren't narcissists, and they don't have narcissism, but they will have narcissistic traits. That is a brilliant explanation. Thank you very much for that. Okay. You're welcome. Is it possible for a narcissist, for you, to love? Well, <clears throat> the short answer is no, because we have no emotional empathy. Yeah. <clears throat> of course, your starting point is, well, what do you define as love? And as I've come to understand from my interaction with other people, love is supporting somebody not abusing them, showing respect, recognizing similarities with that person and differences, wanting to spend time with that individual, wanting to experience intimacy, where it's a, a romantic relationship, where that love manifests. And so a, that form of love that's founded on emotional empathy, we don't have. So we are incapable of love as defined in that way. What we create, is a version of love and i don't really like to talk in those terms because i don't want people to think oh well the narcissist loves me in his own way because that is dangerous for people you have to understand we don't actually love you that's what has to be understood what we create many unaware narcissists do believe they're in love why because the narcissism has to make them believe that so they are motivated to control that person, draw fuel from them, etc. If the narcissism didn't create a sensation and a belief in the narcissist, the narcissist wouldn't be compelled to pursue the prime aims and therefore would no longer survive or thrive. So in the same way, your throat is dry and it's uncomfortable, and you understand that means you're thirsty, so you go and get a drink of water, you're motivated to get that water, which keeps you hydrated and means you don't become dehydrated and suffer serious injury or death the narcissism must compel the narcissist through feeling so it makes us envious it makes us furious it fills us with hatred it causes us to be jealous it causes us to be irritated and it will cause a narcissist to believe that he or she loves somebody their partner their parents their child but we don't we are able through cognitive empathy to create the image of loving somebody and what then becomes dangerous is our vision of love as driven by our narcissism is extravagant and flamboyant love is a many splendid thing love is all you need love is all around it's standing beneath the balcony in the pouring rain and reciting poetry that's not love that's a manifestation of supposed love it's filling your room with bouquets of red roses that's not love it's a romantic representation and because narcissists invariably get into positions of influence and power namely literature film um, art even writing the insides of hallmark cards we create an agenda which causes people to believe that that's actual love and it's not so when we come along and do all of those things an empathic victim goes, oh my goodness, I mean, look at all this, I'm bowled over with all this representation of love. But it isn't. It's window dressing. And it bleeds into the mainstream that people think, yeah, to demonstrate my love on the 14th of February, I need to get somebody a big tacky padded card, some chocolates and flowers. That's not love. That's merely a representation which is driven by us, my kind, to create that idea. Because actual love it's quite boring. It's safe and it's steady and it's supportive, but that's not what we want because we want the razzmatazz and the blitzkrieg when we come in to, to basically get you into submission through all of the sound and light show that we come along with. Whereas if we just turn up and you know, be supportive and, and be respectful, it, doesn't, it won't sweep you off your feet initially. We have to get hold of you very quickly. So... We don't love 
we create a representation of love which cons people. So with your narcissistic mother and yes. other, other people in your family, there's no kind of, you don't feel any familial bond? No, um, my mother isn't. My mother is only named that by biology. Yeah. She has not behaved towards me in a way that would earn that title. I only give her that label for ease of use. I usually refer to as matronarch. Um, I have very little to do with her. I do that because, not because she causes a major problem for her, but it amuses me because she will ring me and I'll purposely ignore her. And then I'll be left with a voicemail where she's lambasting me, which entertains me because I've got to her. And I will attend maybe two or three family events a year. And she doesn't have anywhere near the level of impact she has on me when I was a child, of course. But there's no bond between us. She thinks that she's a good mother. She thinks that she was harsh yet fair, that the world is a difficult place and that she brought me up to realise that and equipped me for it. That's her justification in her mind for the abuse that was dealt out against me. I see her for what she is, know full well how she behaves. And when I was young, I actually admired parts of her behaviour, the way that people would part like the Red Sea when she entered a room and that, the, that they would be at her beck and call. And I remember thinking, I want him to do that for me. So I mimicked some of her behaviours uh, because I recognised the power that she wielded. But there's no familiar bond between us. Tell me about the psychopathic part of you. Well, that element of me is where I am able at certain periods to be a loner, that I have a higher executive function in terms of, although I have the... Uh, impulsivity, impulsivity that goes with it I don't do so in such a reckless way so the sort of lower end of my kind the ones that you find in prison uh, people like me don't go to prison too clever to do that thinking ahead planning and plotting but I see people that just play things for me and I get bored very quickly so I need to alleviate that boredom and the best way of doing so is playing with people I want to own people and make them my possessions. And so I see them as that, as they're just uh, disposable. I see, I find it entertaining to push people to alleviate the boredom that I experience from that aspect of my antisocial personality disorder. And of course, the processing of fear is different, which gives me a huge advantage in terms of what I do professionally and also the governance of individuals privately. So as a child, did you know you were different and did you yeah. not have friends what was that like <clears throat> yeah yes i had i had friends because i came from a privileged background which lends one certain advantages i also learned how to mimic so that i could fit in and i have an empathic um, uh, brother and sister who i learned from so I would basically, they used to think I was like a little alien because I used to ask, them, why is water leaking from your eyes? And they'd laugh and they'd say, that's tears, that's crying. I'd say, well, what's that? Why are you doing it? And they'd explain and they'd find it, they'd find it more amusing and curious. And so I'd ask questions because I realized that I didn't feel in the way that they did. I would see the way that they would jump up and down and get excited and I never did. The only thing that made me feel was a sensation of feeling powerful was when I got somebody to react to something that I did. So if a birthday was coming up, I was pretty, mm, okay, it's a birthday. On the day when everybody's singing happy birthday to me, I'm king of the castle because I'm receiving all of that fuel. But I always knew that I was special and set it apart. But I also recognised as well that people were there to do what I wanted. And repeatedly, if somebody got in my way, as I now look back on it, I would have to respond in a way to punish them in some way, no matter how trivial it might seem. Uh, one of the things I had was a fixation with fire. And that was often a way that I would get back at people, would be burn things. So where somebody had crossed me, uh, I would then think about how could I burn something that belonged to them and do so in a way where I wouldn't get caught as well. You see, I'm not haphazard. I think ahead of what the best time to strike. I, I don't respond in a knee-jerk fashion. 
in other instances uh, where somebody would cause me a problem, I'd have no difficulty in meeting it against uh, a peer because they deserved it. But I had friends because I also recognised the value of uh, essentially people, one can motivate them through fear or greed. And greed could be sh- giving them some biscuits when you're a child or letting them play with one of your toys or inviting them round and to motivate them. So I watched the way that other people operated and, they, and I mimicked the way that, they, that enabled me to fit in. So they didn't realise that there was something different about me, but I knew that there was. I think it's maybe easy <clears throat> out of ignorance to to jump to the assumption that because you lack empathy you don't have feelings but when I listen to you when I listen to you clearly there are feelings because there's a lust there's a lust for power and yes. there's a there's it's almost like eating delicious food there's a deliciousness about maybe when you hurt someone or maybe when you get one over on someone so there's there's something I don't know why I'm experiencing it like um delicious food but there there is there is a feeling mechanism it's just from my perspective distorted but it's it's not the absence of feeling otherwise there couldn't be the lust for power Tell That's me what right. Although, <laughs> although, the, the, although there is an emptiness that needs to be filled, uh, people commonly think, oh, you have no feelings. Well, yes, or you, you have no emotions. Well, I do. As I mentioned, envy, jealousy, hatred, antipathy, irritation, infatuation. Don't tend to have so many of the positive ones. So happiness, joy, love, those types of things from where I stand. Love only seems to cause problems for people. So quite content not to have anything to do with that nonsense other than use it to my advantage. So there isn't an absence of feeling. There are feelings there. There just aren't as many. And they are, um, some are missing and others are kept in check at an appropriate time. I've also learned, and this took quite a lot of effort in terms of, and I, I, I have, talked about this in one of my videos the imitation game where i've learned the suitable uh, cadence to adopt when speaking and tone to adopt in certain instances so that uh, there isn't that flat response i did some i launched some videos about the tinder swindler you may have heard of and one of the notable things is that in many of his messages that he leaves has a flat effect save when He's being challenged and then he demonstrates his fury. Yeah. He, he doesn't, he hasn't learned how to speak with a softness to his voice, with an affection. I have. That doesn't come from a genuine place within me where I'm feeling it. I intellectualize what that response should be. So in the way, for example, Steve Coogan knows how to mimic Margaret Thatcher's voice, I have learned how to mimic what somebody sounds like when they're being sort of all gooey and lovey-dovey with somebody. I don't feel it. I know how to represent it. I know how to change my facial expression. So that cherry picker somewhere inside the depths of me goes to that shelf in that vast warehouse. And and it's this scenario. Okay, HG, you need to demonstrate concern for this individual. So the cherry picker takes the parcel off the shelf brings it back and applies it to me like a blank canvas and I bolt it on and I know right I my facial expression needs to be like this not just staring I need to change my tone so it's like this rather than just flat or angry I know that my body language should be in this me- in, in this way in order to so perhaps a hand on the shoulder or god forbid having to hug them those types of things that I've learned to do in an instance where something has been said that's recognised as amusing, along goes a cherry picker, brings it to me, right, laugh. Uh, an expression of lightness on the face, etc. So there's many of those things. Some of my kind never learn it. There's a gap on the shelf. So when the cherry picker comes back, you get no response. I call it a 404 moment. And you think, what's wrong with that person? They're not responding. There's, there's nothing there. My... Uh, evolution and those similar to me 
have become experts at the mimicry so that you have to look very carefully to see that microsecond of hesitation or pause as the cherry picker makes its way back and applies the relevant veneer which you then experience some you see a longer pause sometimes it misfires and the wrong parcel is brought back so you'll see somebody that laughs in an inappropriate moment because they don't actually emotionally know what the response is they have to intellectualize it and they get it wrong you spoke about emptiness <clears throat> and I imagine that's why you need the constant fuel because you're trying to fill up that, that empty space. Correct. Why is there that emptiness there? It's a part of why the way that one has evolved, I think, for other people who aren't of our kind. You have the ability, I suppose, to self-fuel, that you're able to... Uh, no emptiness is created because you've got something there already, which is this ability to self-fuel yourselves. We haven't. And therefore, whatever it is that you've got, let, let's, as an analogy, you have an engine inside you that self-fuels you. Our engine's missing, hence there's a gap. And we therefore have to borrow or rather steal and take the engines, the fuel from other people to then fill up that emptiness. And of course, it never gets full. It's an ever, it's an ongoing. The only time that we don't need the fuel is when we're unconscious. And well, let me correct that. We're not looking for fuel when we're unconscious. There are periods of time when one is well fueled that one doesn't have to keep looking for it. So, for instance, I could spend the entire day not receiving fuel from anybody if I'd started off the morning very well fueled. It's not going to cause a problem for me. The reality is, in the course of my day, I am going to interact with lots of people, telephone calls, emails, messages, face-to-face -face meetings, involvement with people in my private life. So I receive fuel in that way. And I have a complex and varied fuel matrix. So it would only be in certain circumstances where my fuel level would drop to a level that emptiness really makes its presence felt. For other narcissists, they're not as good at doing that. And so what they have is a restlessness that's more or less ever present. So even when they might be sat there on a, uh, in the sunshine on holiday, apparently enjoying themselves, there's that restlessness there, that nagging itch, but they don't know what it is that's driving them to try and create a drama to receive some fuel. So that's why often you'll get a narcissist where it seems everything's calm, suddenly creates drama out of nowhere because it's a catalyst to gain that fuel. I suppose where my mind's going to is I can't help being being the therapist and so I'm thinking a lot of, about a lot of the people that come to me and when they mm -hmm. most of us have never had the parents that we would have we would like right that's true for most people and okay. the, the people that have got been very deprived of that parental connection and love tend to describe exactly what you're saying this sense of emptiness uh -huh. um so where, where where am i going with that so do you think that's do you think that's similar because i'm thinking about you as a child with a narcissistic mother you're never uh -huh. gonna you're never of you never will have got your needs met do you think uh -huh. that contributes to that empty place or do you not care do you just it does it not matter to you you just are what you are and that's it well, it doesn't matter to me in the sense that I'm hugely effective as I am. People yeah. often say, gee, would you not like to love? And as I mentioned earlier, Lucinda, from where I stand, love just causes problems for people. So, no, I i don't need that. Um, You'll never feel the richness I, of it either, will you? But I don't need to. No, I won't, but it doesn't cause me a problem. I don't sit there and think, oh, dear, poor me. I won't feel the richness of life that other people describe. I've never felt it, so I don't miss it, do I? So it's never going to be an issue for me. And what motivates me? I'm not interested in all of that. It sounds weak to me. What interests me is playing with people and the receipt of fuel and gaining that power. That's what motivates me. I understand that other people will say, oh, no, that doesn't appeal to me. I get that. You have a different perspective. Everything about this world is perspectives. Indeed. But they'll say, well, 
I have that richness of my life, you know, and that I, I love that person and I receive their love. And I said, well, I receive love from people. I've been loved by all my former intimate partners that I've had. So I receive love, I just am capable of giving it. And I don't experience the feelings that other people talk about, but it doesn't trouble me. I, I don't lament the absence of those things because other things that drive me, for instance, do you think the shark looks at the horse and thinks, I wish I could run around in a field? He doesn't. He's quite content going through the deep eating things. We're the same. So you would, you would never want it to be any different? No, why? I always win. I, I'm not curled up in the fetal position crying about my lost relationship. I've created that person. I've caused them to curl up in that fetal position crying about the loss of the relationship. I'm the doer, I'm not the done too. So uh, the individuals that have all of these things invariably are the ones that have all of the problems. I understand that people would disagree with me because I go back to the point, I, I understand there's different perspectives, but it's understandable because empathic individuals do this. They want to say, oh, wouldn't it be nice for you, HG, for you to feel these things? And it's just their empathy. They're not being prescriptive towards me. I recognize, I didn't always think that way, I've come to learn that, that they're just saying, it would be good for you to be able to experience those things because they are wonderful things. We find it joyous and uplifting. I, say, I understand you do, it's not for me. I'm a shark in the water. I don't need to, nor want to run around like a horse in a field, thank you very much. You might say, oh, it's great running around here, you know, racing up and down in, in the field. Good, well, you carry on doing that. I'm quite happy going after that seal that I'm going to take a bite out of now. Thank you very much. So that's my world. and I'm perfectly content within it. You will get some narcissists who will lament it, but it's not genuine because what's happening is their narcissism is using it as an opportunity for pity play. The type I am, and I don't do pity plays. That's weak. It's pathetic. But other types of narcissists say, oh, I wish I could feel, I wish I... I, I wish I could feel the joy and the happiness that you talk about. I wish the emptiness could go away, but it's not actually genuine. All their narcissism is doing is saying, here's an excellent opportunity to be a big crybaby, to assert control over that person that's listening to you and receive fuel from them. Because what is it that the narcissism has to do? It has to get the prime aims of fuel and control. So with certain narcissists, it turns them into uh, meaning out of crybabies. And that's their modus operandi for controlling and getting through other people are very much the different type of narcissist is is brusque and bullying and brash and a boaster that's how he controls people i'm brilliant look at me yeah you are thank you very much you better say i'm brilliant or i'll kick your teeth in. oh yes you are brilliant so he receives the fuel and the control that way There's, as you you may be familiar with the different classifications and subschools that i have of the narcissist there are all those various variations on theme listen yeah so you, you have a disdain for people with traits like me that are highly empathic. Well, because <clears throat> you see I have it a as disdain. Weakness. Yes, I see it as weakness. I understand that you won't, but I do, because it leads to you being ensnared by my kind. And so that presents a problem for you. And so I see it as, I see, I see that as, uh, as a weakness, the uh, the need to give that love, the need to behave in a particular way, uh, I see as a weakness. I recognise, of course, that people will turn it around and say, but hang on, you need us for fuel. So isn't that an issue for you? Well, it is, but it doesn't become a problem for me because I'm always able to obtain it. Do you... Do you, so you don't recognize feelings like sadness and loneliness? No, uh, I never feel sad. I don't cry. I vaguely recall doing so as a very young child, but then it effectively was beaten out of me. Big boys don't cry, HG. So I no longer did. And I haven't done for many, many, many years. Nothing causes me to because i don't feel sorry for myself there are narcissists that do when they cry they're not crying for you they're crying for themselves governed by the way that their narcissism is functioning but i don't feel sadness i don't feel happiness i feel the effects of the fuel and the power that's associated with 
with all of that. So again, when I see somebody who's mourning the loss of the relationship and crying their eyes out, they're empathic, that's a weakness. Where I see a mid-range narcissist crying his eyes out over the supposed loss of the relationship, that's just a manipulation to those around him. But again, I think that's pathetic. I have as much disdain as I do for members of my brethren as I do for empathic individuals. As I've explained to people, I don't have any prejudices. I hate everybody equally. So you would say that you hate people? I do, when they get in my way. Yeah, so what else should we, should we know about you? What else should we be aware of? Of me or my kind generally? Of, well, of either or both. Well, if you want to know more about me, there's a raft of material which you can access, which tells you a lot more about the way that I behave, the way I have behaved what I'm doing, my outlook, etc. And you can find that through my books. You can find it in the YouTube videos. You can find it in material in the Knowledge Vault. And there's far more there than I can encapsulate in talking to you now. The key things to understand with to my kind generally are that we are to be avoided because we will only cause you problems. You can't manage us. If you think you can, you're deluding yourself. And when you realize that you're dealing with our kind, the most appropriate thing for you to do is look to your own defences and apply the principle of go so, which is to get out and to stay out. And that's what you have to do. You have to recognise that most narcissists don't know what they are, and no matter how many times you try and tell that person that they're the problem, they can't see it. You're the problem, because our worldview causes us to see you as the problem. And all you're doing is making it worse by insisting nor should you try and flatter us and uh, kiss our bottoms because there are those that don't understand our kind and think that's the way to deal with the narcissist. It isn't because we will see through it as insincere, which means then you've offended us and threatened our control, we'll lash out. If you're painted black, it doesn't matter what you do. Everything is seen through that lens of black, therefore we will lash out at you. If you continue to involve yourself with us, you will increase your own emotional thinking, which means you won't listen to logic and you'll stay ensnared. So repeated involvement with a narcissist, although there are those who are invariably unaware mid-range narcissists themselves who say, well, one way you can handle the narcissist to, is to give them what they want, become completely super, and throw the flattery on them and all the rest of it. Well, first of all, ask yourself, why should you do that? You should be who you are. So rather than trying to mould yourself around us. And then moreover, it won't work anyway, so don't bother. You'll just end up losing in some shape or form because you'll give us fuel, which means we get what we want. And then we will turn around and lash out at you because either your fuel will become stale or you'll make a misstep because you're walking through a minefield or we see it as insincere and we lash out or you're doing it because you've been painted black. And there are times you won't even realise you've been painted black because it's wheels within wheels. Something else shifts in the fuel matrix which causes you to become painted black. You might do something uh, which you think is innocuous, but it isn't in our world. You become painted black. So when you first come to us, we, you're painted white. Oh, you're beautiful. I love the fact that you look after your body and you wear nice clothes and you have makeup and that you attend the gym and you eat a good diet. That's fantastic. I really love that sexy body that you have. You're so beautiful. You're painted black. You spend far too much time down at the gym. With me. I'm sick of eating fatty diets because of you. You spend far too much money on clothing, and that makeup really doesn't suit you. Everything that we once said about you was amazing is now rubbish because you've seen through that lens of being painted black. We have no fixed, fixed view of you. You're amazing when you're not when you're giving us what we want and not threatening our control, and you're Satan and a traitor and treacherous when you're not giving us what we want and you're affecting our need for control. But what about when we need to come into contact with, with your kind? Well, How, how's <clears> best <throat> to manage it then? Well, the starting point is to really ask yourself this question and to sort of stand to one side of your own thoughts and apply some metacognition and to ask, do I really need to be involved with this narcissist? Are there ways where I can avoid it? So an example might be where you're co-parenting, which is a common situation that people explain is difficult for them. Yeah. so you might say well i can't avoid the narcissist i have to drop the children off well do you 
can't you get somebody else to do it? There you are, involve a gatekeeper. Well, I have to have communication with them. Do you? Can you not limit it to emails rather than speaking on the telephone or do it through somebody else? So there are steps that can be taken where at the starting point you consider, do I really need to have an involvement? Because often what's happening is your own addiction to the narcissist and the emotional thinking created by that, which is what empathic people have, cons you into thinking, I have no choice but to be involved with this person. I have to do this. Whereas standing back from it and using some logic, you may realize, actually, no, I don't. So that's the starting point. Where, for instance, you can't, and there is a legitimate exception to the no contact regime. And for instance, a court order says you must have a telephone number between you and the narcissist so that there must be communication. You can't disobey a court order. So you have to go with that. So in those circumstances, what you have to ensure is that you understand the narcissist will use that electronic conduit to try and control you. And what you have to do is when the narcissist will likely send you provocative messages, don't respond to them. Don't immediately go, oh my goodness, he's criticizing my parenting skills. I'm going to set him straight. Think this person is a narcissist. He's goading me and provoking me because he needs to assert control over me with the unconscious expectation he's going to get fuel from me. I know I'm a good parent. I don't have to convince him. Moreover, it's pointless because he won't accept it. So instead, I won't respond to that provocation. And what I'll do is I will set him straight once by pointing out that I did include sandwiches in little Johnny's lunchbox. So it's there as a matter of record in case he needs to go in front of the court. But don't keep trying to persuade the narcissist that you're right and he's wrong because you're threatening our control and we can't let that happen. So it's about the process that's best is that you stay away from us. If you then consider, do I really, really need to have an involvement with this narcissist? Analyze that. If the conclusion after considerable uh, contemplation is that you do, keep it to the minimum. I suppose lastly, what I want to ask you is, you you talk about your kind and mm. you talk about knowing that you are special. Yes. Do This might be a, a superfluous question, but, but do you, do you see yourself as a different species in a way? A superior one. I'm a sapiens like you, but I've just evolved in a different way. So I'm, I suppose, by definition, you might say that there are subspecies within Homo sapiens. I suppose you could argue that it's where do you draw the line? I am different from you for reasons that have already been articulated and different from many other people. And we are a, a grouping of our own. But if you were to look at me, you'd say, yeah, that's a, a male Homo sapiens. And when I speak, you have that conclusion also. And I need to eat and breathe air and use the bathroom in similar ways to anybody of our species. But with certain things, there are distinct and defined differences where I think you could argue that we form a subspecies. Yeah, because if you're talking about the, what it means to be human in an emotional sense you yeah. your wiring if you like is very different agreed yeah i mean there are those of course that describe us as almost reptilian or aliens or yeah. robots and things like that <laughs> yeah. and that that's to suggest that we are less than human i am human in the sense that cut me and i will bleed uh, as mentioned i'm human in the sense that i need oxygen and so forth but there are significant differences between my kind and your kind and uh, other people so uh, in an emotional sense you could you could run an argument and say well you're not human in that sense but then it would be to say well it's not so much not being human it's just a different type of human i think is the appropriate way to describe it it's a subset rather than something completely different there are enough similarities between you and I, for instance, in physical appearance and certain needs that you would say, well, we would group them all together. 
compared to an amorphous blob from the planet Zog that uh, needs um, sulfur rather than oxygen to survive. That is a completely different species. Yeah, yeah, great answer. So do, um, do you see yourself as just, just meat and cells and when you die, you die and that's it? Well, I don't see myself as just anything. Um, I'm more than that, but my view is that my physical form will, and I'm a long way away from this, will eventually stop. And for me, that's it, it's game over. Okay, so you say your physical form will just stop. Yeah. And, so, and so everything about you will stop or is there something beyond the physical? Well, I don't see that there's anything beyond the physical. I know people have different views there. There might be, what I see as a possibility is the circuitry that I have, if the, the sort of the processes that exist within me, the brain power mm. could be downloaded and placed within another physical form to allow me to continue. We, we're starting to do this already, aren't we? Prosthetic limbs, hearing aids. So we have you know, the advent of uh, uh, sort of nano robotics and so forth that we might be able to sort of self repair aspects of us. That people, you know, we can grow ears on the backs of mice and so on and so forth. So this physical encasement that I'm in has a shelf life. It gets worn out and it can get damaged and broken. Parts of it might be repaired, but ultimately, like a car that can't run forever, our physical form breaks down in some shape or form. But I think the big capacity for being able to download the circuitry within me, what's harness what's in my brain, and then go and put it in another, for want of a better description, meat suit, and then carry on. I don't subscribe to there being some kind of spirit or soul or essence in that way. Other people do. That's their perspective. That's fine. We just don't agree on that. Okay. Thank you. So I'm aware of the time. Thank you very okay. much for your generosity. What is there any last thoughts or anything that you'd like to leave us with for today? Oh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you. It's been very interesting to do so. If people want to understand more about narcissism and psychopathy, and you think that you're involved with one and you want help about it, I would encourage you to use my fast resources that are available to you at my blog, which is narcsite, N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E.com, and my YouTube channel, which is HG Tudor, knowing the narcissist ultra, as knowledge vault and consultations. So embrace all of that material, there's a huge amount of it, it's free. Some of it is paid for and that will enable you to receive unrivaled insight and understanding about what you're dealing with or what you suspect you're dealing with and to be able to do something about it and I encourage people to access all of that material. Hi everyone, if you like asking questions like me, please like and subscribe. Thank you!